Great. Good to see you here. And thank you so much for taking our time on a Friday to be here. Um, if so, the intention of this session is basically to ask, um, to answer your questions. Uh, I know I haven't done this session in a while. I was busy traveling, had some health issues, uh, so and so forth. And um, earlier I would do it once a month, but this time I think we had a couple of months of gap. And I know a lot of questions keep coming on the WhatsApp group and a lot of you also email me the questions, but obviously it's physically impossible for me to answer all of those questions on emails. So I thought, it's high time I did another one of these sessions to answer your questions in person. So I'm going to leave the floor to you. Uh, feel free to ask whatever is going on in your mind. Uh, I'll do my best to answer right here. Or I'll point you to existing resources if I've already answered that question somewhere. Cool. And it'd be great if you guys can, you know, turn on your camera so I can see you. Because um, otherwise it feels like I'm talking to a wall of names. Okay, Priya can't hear me. Is there anyone else? Um, guys, if you can hear me, just give a thumbs up or just say type yes in the chat window, right? Okay, Priya, you might want to check your earphones in because others are able to hear me. Cool. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can go ahead and uh, ask. Wow, no questions in a Q&A session. Okay, Satya Priya, you can unmute and ask your question, please. Yeah, hi, Supriya. Hi. So my question to you is, what are the key frameworks and considerations that we need to take while writing a premium content? Uh, say, CXO branding, thought leadership, and media articles. Okay. Um, <laughs> being a person who's very against frameworks, that's an interesting question for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Because... And this actually I was answering on the eight-week intensive just a couple of days ago. Uh, is because when you limit yourself into a framework, you run the risk of becoming repetitive. Okay. It's um I don't know if you read Mills and Boone <laughs> when you were younger, but we did. And if you read two books and the third one just feels like it's a repeat of the same formula, right? And similarly, like a lot of these um, Nancy Tools and Sydney Shells, all those books which come in a series somehow uh, end up becoming a formula that you as a reader can quickly catch on that, you know, they're saying the same thing over and over again. And that's what I feel happens when you overly rely on frameworks. Yeah. So my technique to write premium content, and that has served me for so many years now, is I treat every piece of content as unique. See, because what is a fundamental structure of any content piece, be it a thought leadership article, be it a uh, press release, be it a social media post, you have to first set context for the reader. Why the hell are they even reading this, right? So mm -hmm. that becomes the introduction. Then you get to the main point. What do you want to say? And you know what are the pain points, et cetera, that you're addressing for them? And then you come mm -hmm. to a conclusion where you are asking them to do something, right? Or where you're like leaving them with a thought. So that's effectively mm -hmm. what the structure is. Mm -hmm. Now in different contexts, depending on different client needs, depending on different audience, these three things will change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And to get that right, you have to ask questions to your client, right? What do you want to see? What does your target audience want to hear? Uh, what are some of the most important things that make sense to you? What is it that you want to say that nobody else is saying? So I would like, it's my, uh, be my formula to really treat everything as a unique content piece and not get into, tied up into any framework. Um, but I don't know if that's uh, like answers your question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is and what- can, If you can take, you take uh, you know, uh, 
some of the best uh, piece in each of these categories and explain what was your thought process while writing that that would be great um okay so i can't share my client work unfortunately because that's all tied into with ndas i share it on my eight week intensive because everybody who joins my eight week intensive signs an nda with me right okay so in a public forum i'm not at liberty to to share that what you can do is i'm going to give you a link to my personal guidelines which have been published on world economic forum and what i really like um in terms of how i personally write, like to write let me just share that it's actually also in the whatsapp group uh, i'll share it in the chat okay. So I'm sharing my profile on the World Economic Forum and there are some three articles, four articles under it. Yeah, four articles. You can go there and see what I consider uh, to be good structure. Typically, it is about, um, you know, one second, let me find a chat. Typically, I like to tell stories, right? I like to tell people... Uh, I like to write content that resonates with people. So if you've taken my 30-day email course, um, I'm hoping that it comes across as I am directly talking to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because I like to dig through personal experiences. I like to explain concepts via uh, different types of storytelling. And I like to keep my content interesting and conversational and not make it boring. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I also feel in every sphere, right? Even in B2B, that's gaining more popularity. In fact, it recently happened that I write bylines for a CEO um, every month, like three bylines I write, but they want me to write way more and I didn't have bandwidth to do it. So the team said, okay, you know what? You've written one byline, which is for the US market. Now let's just get somebody from your team to repurpose it for the India market, okay? So we repurposed mm -hmm. the bylines I had written um and obviously everybody's totality is different right um mm -hmm. so the client came back and said so this is not getting approved i said okay what happened you know give me some feedback so i can you know go and get it fixed and they said the tone is just not right <laughs> you write the ones you write are conversational storytelling and this one is just very old plain text right mm -hmm. so that is i feel a lot of now companies are waking up to the fact that people don't want to read boring academic stuff. They want to read interesting, uh, engaging stories, no matter which industry they're in, right? Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, changing. And that's more important when you end up writing any piece of content, which doesn't make, which doesn't mean make it frivolous, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it, it should still convey the message it is supposed to convey, um, mm -hmm. Like, don't get lost in the storytelling, but the story, like, makes the me message more palatable to the ultimate reader. Sure. Sure. Thank you. No worries. Uh, Praveen, you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. Ma'am, are you audible? Yes, I can hear you. Ma'am, I'm start this... Uh... Ma'am? Yeah, tell me. Hello? How to start? A... How to start? Content writing, ma'am. How to write? How to start? And then finish. Oh, yes, ma'am. How to start content writing? At... Content writing. I'm a beginner, ma'am. Okay, um, <laughs> that's a very big question. <laughs> How to start content writing would be first to, uh, there is actually a session I did um, on the Ascend framework. I also sent it to uh, a lot of, I don't know if you joined after that. Let me actually send a link to that also, right? Because it's a very big question uh, for me to answer in the space of this time frame, but in that webinar, what I did was I explained the different things you need to understand before you start your career as a content writer. And the first thing is to figure out what are your skills and capabilities, right? Uh, what is the, going to be the right market for you? And where are you going to find your clients, right? What is going to be your offer? What type of content you're going to write? 
So I'm going to share that one second link to the video. You can, it's a one, one and a half hour webinar. So you can watch that um, at your leisure and you will get the answer to this question. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yeah, one second. Let me just copy this link and post yeah. it in the chat and then I'll take the next question. Um, Okay, so I posted the link to the uh, webinar. Um, cool. Sorry, who had the question? I was I didn't have my screen open that time. Yeah, hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Soham here. Soham Hi. Uh, I just hi, hi. So I just want to ask you when the next uh, session, like eight week course, that comes to take place. Because I did try to apply for this time, but uh -huh. unfortunately, I was not part of it. But for the next time, how should and when should I start? So we got around 250 applications this time and we honestly tried our best, but we couldn't reach out to everyone. Um, so the next one, we will start in February. Uh, but you could write to, I'm going to um, drop an email ID in the chat box. You can write to mm -hmm. Fahim uh, with the saying that you want to be a part of this and he will dig out your application and see if, you know, there's a right fit and he'll call you. Okay, thanks a lot, ma'am. So I put the email address, Fahim's email address in the chat window. Cool. <laughs> uh, any other logistical questions also, everyone who's here, you can ask Fahim, write to him and ask him. Uh, let's use this time to ask questions about content so that I can answer them directly because those are the ones Fahim may not be able to answer. So anyone else, if you have a question, please raise your hand so I can ask you to unmute. Anyone? Okay, there's a question in chat. If you want to start copywriting through Fiverr Upwork, is the certification mandatory? Um, I don't think you need a certification in anything to start on Fiverr or Upwork. Though uh, I must say what I keep telling people who go to these platforms, that it's a fish market out there, right? There's just so many people out there trying to be on so many projects that it's highly un unlikely that you will get high paying projects there and you will also waste a lot of your time bidding um for work that you may or may not get right uh, if you're a vet if you're like a beginner you have zero experience fine you can go there and do some projects for really low money so you can build a portfolio and you can get some client testimonials but after that i would recommend that you move to linkedin and start reaching out to people directly because that's where more eyeballs and more money is right so you sort of don't get lost in um in the crowd okay so a lot of questions are coming from chat i would prefer if you guys just unmute yourself and talk through your questions okay How can we start a career in content writing? I'm new to it. Could you please suggest some best online courses to upskill myself? I'm also obviously going to tell my courses the best, but I'm not the only one who's saying it. Apparently, there are others who have been a part of the cohort who have really loved it. Uh, and like I said, the next one is starting in February. I unfortunately haven't taken any other content writing courses, so I'm not the best person to say if there is anything else that's better. Um, unless you want to shell out $3,000 and join Alex Kitoni because that's a course that even I took. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm probably not the best person to answer. Maybe others who have joined in here can answer this question that Chandan asked about uh, courses, uh, but I frankly have no clue. Cool. Um, any other questions on what type of content? Saida, hi. I need um, are you audible? Yeah. Praveen, uh, wait one second. I'll just ask Sayada to uh, unmute herself. Am I audible? 
Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, so I wanted to know that <clears throat> just give me a second. Please. There was disturbance at my house. I'm so sorry. Um, so I wanted to know uh, that um, I am like I do am interested in content writing, but um, I feel like what works good better for me is giving prompt to Chat GPT or any AI uh, that has been introduced which has uh, created a lot of confusion among uh, beginners of content writers. So when I give a prompt to ChatGPT, it writes for me in a way that I cannot even write for myself. So uh, is it considered cheating or uh, is it a good thing to incorporate that into your skills or use it for your own advantage? You should definitely use it for your own advantage. And that's, that's actually a very good question. So thank you for asking that. But if you use whatever chat GPT has generated as it is, chances are that AI detectors will pick it up. So personally, now every content that comes to me, I run it past two AI detectors. One is Originality AI, which is a paid one. And one is Copy Leaks AI, which is an unpaid version. But I run it past both of them to make sure that there is, you know, minimal text that start as AI detected, right? Like what my acceptable levels are 4%. AI because sometimes it just marks human text also as AI, right? Um, you should definitely use Chat GPT for advantage because it will help you create content faster. But you should also realize at the same time that clients are paying you for your expertise, right? If they had to use Chat GPT, they could also use it themselves. But but that said, um, and I don't want to scare people, but in three, four, five years down the line, AI is going to take up literally everything that is grunt work, right? And when I say grunt work, it, it means low IQ work, which is, okay, you know, write a couple of meta descriptions or do some product descriptions here or, you know, just write a few emails. It's not going to be, um, people are going to stop outsourcing that. And not even in content, it's going to be in every industry. Like today, KPMG, those big four consultants are getting replaced by AI. So, you know, we are a small fry compared to that. But what is going to continue to be relevant is how uh, you build client relationships, how well you dig deeper into what your client wants to get their stories out, and then how well you use these tools to tell those stories so that they resonate with the target audience, right? So your as these tools keep coming in, you have to keep upping the value proposition. Okay, so today clients don't work with me because I can write good English. That is now a hygiene factor, right? Today, anybody can run their text past Grammarly or any of these tools and get the perfect English. So that's not a criteria, right? The criteria is I tell them what makes sense for them to write. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. One of my clients recently came to me and they said that they want to write a blog on you know, prompt engineering. I was like, they're a healthcare company. I was like, why do you, why do you want to write? And I charge, like, if I write a blog myself, I charge like a 500 word blog, I charge around 15,000 rupees for it. So um, I was like, I mean, I could have just taken a project and written a blog on prompt engineering, right? It would take me max two hours to do it. And that's like easy 15,000 bucks. But I was like, it doesn't make sense, right? You know, you're a healthcare company. Why are you getting into this whole prompt engineering space? And they then when I dug deeper and I asked them questions and they first didn't have answers. And they said that they had some internal session where an internal software expert had given this session to the internal audience. And now because they had that content, they wanted to convert it to, uh, you know, this blog. Mm -hmm. And I said, it doesn't make sense. Don't do this blog. What is it? What, like, who's going to read it? Your clients don't care. They want to know how well you know healthcare. They don't want to know how well you know prompt engineering. And then I said, if you want to write something, you write about Gen AI, right? You make an entire playbook for healthcare folks on how to use Gen AI. And in that, if you want, you can include this prompt engineering, like some 200, 300 words based on the content that you already have. And that idea struck them. And they commissioned me a playbook on Gen AI. So instead of 15,000, I made 60,000, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
it it's when you're able to tell the clients what is relevant for them that is where your value as a content right. writer tools and i'm sorry i'm rambling off on a whole different tangent i tend to do that so please you know uh bear with me. <laughs> i'm sure you all appreciate that yeah so i wanted to like you know just say use the tools but use them with your intelligence added and add that value of no yeah so that's my two cents on it I hope that answers. Uh, thank you so much for answering. May I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what would you recommend uh, beginners in content writing? What niche should they focus on like uh, as a starting point? I am, uh, you guys are asking me questions that I have really different perspectives on because I know everybody tells everyone to just stick with the niche. Yeah. Uh, but I believe in experimenting, okay? My whole life has been um, a journey and experimentation. I just, I try everything because unless I try stuff, I don't know what works for me, right? I mean, if you look at my education background, I'm an engineering and an uh, engineer and a finance MBA. Te technically, I should be sitting in some finance company doing some, you know, product engineering for them. But I'm here <laughs> coaching you guys on content writing, Yeah. So it's, it's, I would say if you're a beginner, it's a great place to be because one, um, if you have a niche that you have experience in, right? Like for me, I was an engineer, so I had some rudimentary understanding of technology and I would say rudimentary because our colleges don't teach us much, right? So we get into the workplace and we're like a blank slate and we learn everything from scratch. So um, if you have that expertise, try and see, okay, make that your main niche, but still experiment with a few more things, right? So I keep telling people, I mean, I've written on perfumes and detergents and wines and like fabric softeners and whatever, right? And and real estate and finance and, you know, coaching. So um, I like to experiment and see what is coming from my heart. Like what what do I really like to do? And what also has the potential to pay me money? right and it's also always good to have your eggs in multiple baskets and i'll tell you why so everybody thinks tech is a great niche to be in because it pays well yeah but tech is so dependent on the us market that when there is a recession there our work stops right um whereas domestic niches which are maybe consumer goods based will continue forever because demand for those goods are you know high typically pretty much across uh, the year, right? So everything has its pros and cons. And I do believe every niche has a potential to pay well. Um, but if you're a beginner, I would recommend, please experiment, see what works for you, and then build your expertise in one or two areas, right? Uh, that's what I would uh, recommend. Cool. Uh, Preeti, I see you on yeah, right. Thank you so much. I you. appreciate your detailed answer. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, good evening. Thanks a lot for uh, this uh, special session. Um, uh, my issue is like two times I took uh, freelancing uh, projects and uh, I had to give up those projects because my anxiety issue was uh, so great that you know, uh, the more training I was uh, having, like I was taking training on YouTube's uh, because that was related to the, you know, scientific writing. And uh, the more training I was getting, and then I realized that I was under pressure that I don't know anything. So uh, I end up um, into something, giving up the project, because this is the anxiety issue. And now I'm looking for some, like, uh, you know, monthly uh, job which should be pay, be paying me monthly basis so uh this is the you know issue which i have uh, been struggling at right two time there are projects they said there is no dearth of projects i can take up as many projects as i want but uh, i could not cope up with the anxiety issue because i could not finish the work on time and i felt more uh, you know, like I, I know less, less, maybe I should be spending more time on training. So how to cope up with such kind of as a beginner, like how to cope up with such kind of stressful situations when you miss the deadlines and then you again doubt yourself. 
So if you can uh, suggest something on that, that would be great. Yeah. I think that's also a very interesting aspect that you've brought up, Preeti, because freelancing is not easy, right? It's a very, it is a very stressful job. And in fact, one of the things I do on the side is to coach freelancers and how to avoid stress and burnout. Okay. Um, and what you said, like, you know, um, and I ask a lot of my friends, like my own sister, okay, she's in a full-time job and I keep telling her that, why don't you quit your job and join my company and we can do like amazing stuff together. But she's like, sorry, this is not for me. I want the stability of going to a job every day and getting that paycheck at the end, right? So people are different. Um, I don't know which which is the niche that you operate in, Preeti? Please repeat the question. Which Do you have any particular area which you're writing? For? Yes, it was uh, scientific writing. Like I was getting a review papers, um, like meta-analysis paper. One was quantitative, another was qualitative. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was not much to do. Like I feel I could do it. Like the confidence of doing it is within me because I have already done that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, you know, the more trainings I'm getting, you now, I feel like, uh, I don't know, uh, the MS office things, maybe I should be getting more training on this. I should be getting, like, you know, the fear of getting judged is so great yeah, that, um, I had to put the project on hold. I, it, it is like giving up the project uh, because um, I thought, uh, you know, at the same time, I, I'm in need of money also. So I should not be. Maybe then there is another fear that what if I don't get the money also from them? So uh, that fear was also there because it is the first time, like there were two independent projects from two different uh, organizations. So uh, since there was not uh, financial communication also, so I had the fear because uh, like I read in one of your 30-day um, uh, email course that uh, they should be sending us some contract. Like when such kind of, it was only verbal because they were friends and they were giving me verbal contracts. So then it hit my mind, maybe I would get looted up or something. I might be ended up uh, doing nothing, but that would have writing something would have given me more confidence, like finance is an issue. So we have to trade off, but at the same time, I have to put my hands on writing also. So uh, then I thought, even if I don't get paid, at least I will be getting confidence in writing and that would be paying me in the longer run. So I can get more streamlined. At least I should be uh, trying my hands on writing. But again, it was like uh, I could not manage these emotions. So I had to give up. No, I totally get it. I think one of your questions you answered yourself about the payments. I'm going to go back to the fear of judgment on, you know, the, the lack of confidence. Uh, and, you know, it strikes everyone, right? Even till today, sometimes I get a project and I'm like, I don't think I'll be able to do it. And I have also let go of stuff, which I wasn't very confident that I would do it. Strangely, it's also women who suffer from this imposter syndrome a lot more. Uh, research says it. <laughs> uh, but sometimes I ask myself this question and it tends to work for me. Uh, and it's it's worked for me in the riskiest situations that I have ever encountered. Right? And I've done, I've taken a lot of risky decisions in life. And uh, I always ask myself, what is the worst that could happen? right okay i did the project i sent it to them they didn't like it so what like what's the worst they will never send me another project that's fine i'll find another client right uh so that sort of like already sort of being okay with the worst helps me cope with whatever response is coming and typically it you will once you start doing this you'll realize that it is much 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 milder than what you had pictured in your head right because our imaginations tend to run away with us and we start questioning ourselves way more than what other people do. Yeah. Um, so I would say, try this for a bit. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but this is a this is something that has worked for me. So I'm sharing that with you. Try it a little bit and see if that works for you. Visualize what's the worst that can happen. Be okay with that and just do the work and send it over, right? Um and and I'm sure you will see positive results. And I'd love to hear back from you also once you do this, uh, what happened after that. So I um, would really want to see how it shaped up. Thanks a lot. That's great. That's great. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Pradnya, hi. Do you want to unmute yourself? Arya. Hi. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for this lovely session, first of all. And uh, so I uh, actually um, want to explore freelancing uh, projects, uh, especially in content writing, because earlier I had no confidence in my writing skills. But um, recently I completed my master's, kind of, you know, pushed me to explore this new territory. And, uh, and also I have learned this entire new world where people are actually writing for earning a good income. And income is just a side, side uh, like it's a byproduct. Of course, we want to do that, but I have seen uh, that we, that cannot be the sole focus. So that's why coming back to, to my question, uh, how do I uh, like introspect? How do I assess my own skills? And uh, I think one, I already someone asked how to find a niche, uh, which you which you kind of answered, but if you can just brush up against it again. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, one is the, I don't know if you saw the link to the YouTube video I shared um, in the chat. If you go over that, that's a complete, you know, it's, I call it the ascend framework in that the first part is assess your skills. So there's some questions there. Um, like the first part is specifically on that. So go over that uh, to see what is it that you bring to the table, right? And like I said, language grammar has become hygiene factors, but it has to be a little bit more, right? What is your expertise in this space? Um, how well, uh, like, are you trustworthy? Are you going to deliver stuff on time? Are you going to be able to uh, communicate and understand the client needs, etc.? So there are lots of those things that you might have to uh, look through. So I'll say go over that video and uh, hopefully that'll give you some questions to assess your capabilities. Um, and your second question was on the niche, right? So <clears throat> like I said, if you're coming from, let's say a finance, a technology, legal, HR, those kind of backgrounds uh, where you have some experience, then it makes sense to make that your main niche, right? Because you know it, you don't have to spend a lot of time understanding it. But if you're beginning in content writing, I would also recommend try a few different things, right? Because unless you try new things, you don't know whether you like it or not, right? So, um, and I'll tell you how this happened with me very recently also, right? The reason I started coaching, I wasn't very, like, it hadn't even entered my head that I should coach people, right? I was very happy running my business. I'm making crores and revenues every year. Why, you know, why do I need to get into this? Um till I met my coach and he said, uh, I wasn't able to find people who would be able to write for me. And he said, why don't you coach them? And I was like, you know, who's going to learn from me? Uh, but he said, let's give it a try. And I'm, like I said, I'm very open to experimentation. I said, okay, let's give it a try. And when I did try it, I found that I loved it and therefore I'm doing more and more of it. Um, so as beginners, I would say, don't get stuck on a niche, experiment a little bit see what flows with you and then then work with that yeah thanks for the answer can i ask one more question yeah well, yeah so uh so another question like important uh, hindrance is where to find work the freelance projects so that is also another thing which is answered in the uh, webinar, but I'll give an answer because I'm sure a lot of people are you know, thinking about that question. I personally believe that you should first start looking for work in your circle of influence. And if you've gone through my 30 day email course, I talk about it there as well, right? Now, what do I mean about circle of influence? You have friends, you have family, they have friends, they have family. Somebody is working somewhere, right? Um, and once you start, once you get it in your head that you want to start your business as a content writer, you should start talking to people about it. That, hey, I'm doing this, right? Network more, connect with more people, tell more people about what you're doing. And that's where your biggest projects will be from, okay? Because it is human psychology. Again, I say this over and over in my eight-week course also, that people trust people, okay? They don't trust faceless email IDs. So you can send a lot of cold emails, which is fine. You can send a lot of LinkedIn messages, which is also fine. But if today somebody, you know, recommends you to someone else, 
they will be more likely to call you and give you business from a sense of ab obligation, from a sense of, okay, I can trust this person. Um, and, you know, there's no harm in having a conversation, that kind of thing, right? So you're more likely to get clients and high paying clients if you invest in growing your network. Uh, and again, this is a story I tell people that I got, when I quit my corporate job, I got my first client uh, through my restaurant. Okay. I was running, a, my husband was running a restaurant at that point. Um, we shut it down after he passed away. But um, so it was early stages. And uh, this guy walks into our restaurant and he is like a kid, you know, just passed out from college and he's selling point of sale systems, right? And he gave us a demo of his point of sale system. And it was fantastic because we had a very old fuddy-duddy system. So we we're like, okay, fine, this looks great. And then we got talking to him and I was like, what do you do? And he said, you know, he's started this company and they're selling point of sale systems. And then he said, he's got a $2 million funding. So then we had just started, like I had just started my marketing agency. I said, you know, dude, I will buy your point of sale system. If you give your company's marketing, like branding, you're just starting out, right? To me. So within a week, we wrapped up all of that. Of course, you know, we had, we met all his co-founders and everybody and we did all these interviews, et cetera. Um, and our first project, first ever project that I got was for seven lakh rupees. Yeah, that literally funded our office space and our lights and uh, <laughs> and everything. But what I want to say is you can find clients everywhere, anywhere. You just have to be talking about what you're doing, uh, also giving value. In this case, it was a very, very transactional value exchange. I'll buy off US and you buy, <laughs> you buy my marketing services. But other than that, usually in conversations, what I try to do is help people. And once I have helped them in some way, ultimately that object like their that obligation comes back and they try and help me in some way right either by recommending me to someone or by giving me work when it comes their way so that said network is a first step second step of course is finding people on linkedin and reaching out to them and saying you know hey they're also adding value first giving them something that okay this is amazing and i think you're doing a great job but here's how you can also do better don't sell in your first outreach ever that you know that bugs people so spend some time just being the value provider and then the work will will show up and I'm a very very strong believer of the fact that um, if you chase money then it's not going to materialize but if you chase value then money will follow anywhere right so yeah again a very long answer to a short question but I hope that made sense Cool. Thank you. I thought there was someone. Roshan, you had your hand raised. Do you still want to ask your question or shall I move on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My question was related to uh, what Pradhya had asked uh, about uh, where, to where to start pitching your services. So, uh, is it also okay to start, I mean, fighting for fiber and things? But it's very difficult to get uh, clients from there. There's a lot of competition. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what I uh, said the, in the first one, right? That Fiverr, and I don't want to name anyone, but all these marketplaces are marketplaces, right? So most of the time, people are going there to find, you know, the cheapest, quickest way to get stuff done. They are not, rarely they, they go there for premium stuff, right? Because for premium stuff, once they find a writer, they're going to stick with that writer unless somebody better comes along. Uh, because it's it's painstaking for people to also go to Fiverr and always evaluate a new writer, right? Mm -hmm. So once they found a good person, they have they're stuck to that person. So if you want to break that cycle uh, and move the incumbent over or get a slice of it for yourself, you need to reach out to them on a personal level, right? On LinkedIn, on email, stuff like that, which is one on one connect, not just a faceless interaction on you know one of these portals. Plus, it's also a matter of how people perceive these things, right? And there is another uh, video on my YouTube channel, which is with um, Rishabh Dev. He is uh, he, he he's the founder of MapLinks, a digital agency. And we were having this conversation, and uh, I asked him if, and he goes to Fiverr and Upwork to find people for his, you know, his work. And I said, what if somebody came to you through Fiverr or Upwork, or another person came to you through LinkedIn? Who would you choose, and why? 
he said i will always choose the linkedin person and i will probably also pay them more right because this is a more personalized outreach so i would seriously stick to linkedin and emails as a way to connect with people rather than one of these marketplaces because you tend to get lost also from a perception standpoint it's like going to the sunday vegetable mm -hmm. market versus like a 1mg mall right in the marketplace, you negotiate. In a 1MG mall, you pay 900 bucks for a tiny vanilla essence and you don't bat an eye. So it's your choice where you want to be. Right. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, what, what, would, what did you advise as uh, the starting point? Oh, voice is very low, Roshan. Oh, okay. Sorry? Could you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, what would be an ideal uh, starting price for? Your writing per word. Okay, so again, I don't believe in per word pricing, but I know it's a good comparison for people to to have. Um, see, when I started, and if you look at my per word pricing, I was charging, let's say, I thought that time I was charging three and a half four fees a word, right? When I when I did my second innings, in my first innings, we were like we had. We charged by the hour. So we were charging like 10,000 bucks an hour at that point in time. And we started the first company. And then I started freelancing in 2018 again because my son was born and I didn't want to do the agency thing. Um, and that time also the first project I got for like some 700, 800 word blogs, they would pay me 3,000 bucks. And I said, okay, fine. Some experiences, you know, some money is better than no money. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you're like a beginner, beginner, um, I would say at least one rupee a word, right? Get some experience and quickly try to move to the five rupees a word bucket because I think below that, the effort doesn't make sense, right? So today, everybody who's working with me on a, on the, you know, the eight-week intensive, a lot of people are now working on projects with me and everybody gets paid a minimum of at least five rupees a word. Though I don't do per word pricing, I do per project pricing, Right. So uh, there's this girl who bagged a project which pays her 25K a month and she has to write like one, like some 600 words in the entire month. So, I mean, it's just I it's how you value for, uh, and that's so repetitive, but it's how you price the value that you're providing, which makes a difference, right? So I do have some experience working in a corporate environment. In a corporate I can't environment. hear you very okay. at all. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry? Uh, can you hear me? Now, faintly. Oh, there's some problem with the connection. Yeah, what I was saying is uh, I have some experience working in a company mm -hmm. and I've also done freelance work some time back. So uh, do you think I can charge five rupees per word? So uh, that's also an interesting question. I'm glad that you asked because pricing is not as simple as how much can I charge per word, right? It is based on, is my quality worth five rupees a word? And am I working with the right client who has a budget to pay the five rupees a word? Yeah. So, um, and this is also another example that I keep giving. If you take a diamond to a small village and try to sell it, People can't buy it because they don't have the money to buy it, right? So you might have the highest quality, but if you're working with the wrong clients, they will not be able to pay you. And if you, same thing, if you go to, let's say the Ambani's and try and sell them, like, I don't know, some Jude Puri bag, they will not be interested, right? Because, you know, they, they wear the finest silks. They don't wear the same thing again. Um, so your quality is not worth the, the money that they have and the quality that they want, right? So you've got to get these two factors right do a bit of back and forth okay so price is not fixed for every client no two clients should pay you the same thing so my pricing is very different when you speak to a person when you do a bit of research on what their company is what their propensity to pay is you price it differently right and when let's say two three clients you've spoken to and they have agreed very willingly to pay you the same price then you raise your prices and you try with the next one right uh, so that's it. You get a sense of who is able to pay what. And every time that you send a price quote, you also say, hey, this is what I charge. Send slightly higher, like 20% higher than what you want to charge because they, everybody will negotiate. And then tell them, this is what I charge uh, usually, but I'm open to a negotiation, right? And then 
you, when they talk to you, you get a sense of whether this works or not. And I also say, if you have no work uh, in the pipeline, right, then do the cheap projects, right? Like I said, some money is better than no money. And it at least gives you the experience and, you know, you get to work with different clients, you get the logo, you can get a testimonials. If you have a lot of work, then say no, right? Like just, it happened today, one of my clients sent a white paper. I charge, you know, if I write it myself, I charge around 2000 for a white paper. But I said, sorry, like it's holiday season, we're all anyway packed, we're working on two websites, blah, blah, blah. And we don't have the time to do it. So I can only take it up on 5th of January and deliver it by 12th. So if that timeline works for you, let me know, right? And they said, okay, you know, we need it very urgently by next week. So I said, okay, you get it done from someone else. So, you know, sometimes you also have to do that uh, to, to see if what is your bandwidth and say no to big projects as well, because it doesn't fit in. So I would say try with five, no harm in trying. It's confidence is great, but make sure then your quality is matching the writers who are charging five rupees a word. And then see what is the client feedback, right? If you feel that the client is running away, then you can have another conversation and say, I would really love to work with your brand and I'm happy to offer you a better rate. So you let me know, right? So it's it's a bit of back and forth negotiation, sort of sensing what they want to actually accurately price your services. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you. Nice. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Uh, Anjum, hi. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, yeah. I've, I'm very much interested in this content writing. I have been doing some research on it, but it I'm not able to like, uh, what do you say, narrow down to, I know you can't define content writing, but if I may say, does it involve description of products, promotion of uh, service or something, marketing a product, all that comes into this content writing or is it story? or uh, telling about traveling or anything and what is what, you know everything is content writing anything that you see anything and everything anything and everything is content writing whatever you can bring into the fold of your services and charge for it is content writing like okay you know, we write video scripts ad scripts uh -huh. emails, blogs meta okay. Right, okay. whatever you are willing to pay pay you for, why not? Whatever the client requirement, basically. Okay, that is one thing. Second is I wanted to know about our pay the payment. How do we charge? Which you have answered very well just now. The third thing is, ma'am, you are actually doing this class free of cost and uh, you know giving us so much of this knowledge. And I I I, I don't know how to ask and. Um, like what are you getting out of it or can we work with you will you uh, like uh, take us in your projects if we feel we are doing good or you find us good anything like that like okay. you're just <laughs> a very interesting question one is um, when I do these sessions I actually get to know what are the questions people are facing okay. and then I can you know send you emails on it by answering okay. those questions. other people also get to know um, though I started this coaching for very selfish reasons, which I talked about, right, that I yes. was really happy running my business, but my problem yes. was that I wasn't able to find people who could write well. Yes. And um, um, when I went to my business coach, I asked him, my problem was find me people, right? And he tried, honestly, he did try, but he couldn't find yes. anyone that fit my criteria, okay? Yes. Um, so then he got frustrated and was like, why don't you just coach people yourself? Yeah. Uh, I said oh my god this is going to be such a long drawn process but we said okay let's try it out and I was also very like you know somebody talked about imposter syndrome and I was also like who wants to learn from me so he said you know do a free course see what yeah. comes to that right that's how the 30 day free email course was born yeah. and all I did was basically I imagined a person sitting in front of me who's a beginner content mm. writer um, mm. not a beginner content writer but a content writer mm. who wants to understand how to become a highly paid content writer and I just mm. tried to answer the questions right um, yeah and then after that, uh, a lot of people started pinging me asking for uh, mentorship. Do you provide personal mentorship? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just to give you a context of how much that costs. Uh, mm. If I go and talk for one hour at a corporate, I okay. charge 50,000 rupees. Okay. 50,000. Okay. 50,000 for one hour. Okay. okay. This okay. is what you guys are getting for free right now. Yeah. Yeah. 
So mm -hmm. a lot of people are asking for mentorship and that's how the eight week intensive was born. And I also realized because this group grew really quickly. And okay. after, every time I would send a project request, I would get like 200, 300 people sending their samples. And it's impossible for me to sit and read through all of mm -hmm. that. So that's how the eight week intensive was born, which is where I found these five, six people I work with today um, yeah. who have taken off my workload quite considerably. Um, yeah. so now the the hierarchy works like this. And in January, I'm starting another program, which is called Tectonic, which is only for tech writing. Okay. I also okay. think a lot of other people who are also joining eight week program, which is a okay. more general program anyway, but because 90% okay. of my business is technology, I... Um, yes that mastermind right so now the yeah. hierarchy of working with me is going to be like this because okay. i'm spending eight months with people in tectonic they get okay. the first right of refusal so the first okay. projects go to them okay. if they're not able to take it then they go to the eight week intensive people right because they've spent okay. time and effort in learning with me and yes. writing with me if yes. anything is left over which usually unfortunately isn't then it goes okay. to the free community right okay uh, okay. So that's how that's the funnel of working with funnel. me. Right now. Okay, uh, but I hope it answered both of your questions. Uh, yeah. So we are right now in the free freelance version of it. Yeah, the free uh, version. free version of it. So the eight week intensive is what we should look at to get into the second level. That's what you're saying. I mean, if you want to work with me, there's no. I mean, yeah. the day program is amazing anyway. If okay. I pay yeah. my heart. Uh, yes. quite a bit in eight week intensive what I focus on is more of like busting some myths that content writers have they're like mm -hmm. oh, we're amazing writers and then they come and then they write and I'm like you know and then I give them feedback and they have <laughs> one of them told me it's like a bloodbath <laughs> everything is <red. laughs> so, <laughs> so it's about like truly understanding what content writing okay. should be okay uh, and tectonic is obviously more about yeah you know, tech so yeah. ma'am in these free sessions that you're taking can you i don't know whether it's possible for you can you allow us to send one one sample and get a feedback from you to know where we stand no, and you can't no because you can't. i'm nothing in work so okay. it's impossible for me i mean there are twenty five thousand people in the community oh if my, I oh, yeah. die. because yeah. Even, yeah i get like almost 150 to 200 emails every day yeah. Okay. And yeah. I hire one person only to answer the emails. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm not going okay. to. Have any? Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Any any AI tool or anybody any uh, what do you say a software anyway where I can write and get a feedback as to where I stand or improve or I need to take classes some. Grammarly does that. If you have a Grammarly yeah. version, it will tell you what you can improve. Okay. Uh, there is also Originality AI, which also has readability scores. I think Hemingway also does it. So you okay. can put your text through all of these and you can get an assessment. And you can even do that in ChatGPT where you post your text and the prompt should be review this and let me know how, where it stands in terms of readability. Okay. Etc. How much can I charge? Okay. For it? okay. Close so up. all... Or oh, even Grammarly gives feedback on content writing, is it? So okay. It give feedback as such, but it'll sort of give you recommendations yeah. how you can okay. do it better. Uh, okay. But others do have that. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Japanese, hi. You have a question? I'll take the last two questions now because we're almost at 10 o'clock. So. Hi, Supriya. Uh, so I wanted to know that uh, generally when I write the articles and blogs, they don't pass through originality AI. However, luckily they do pass through copy leaks after multiple edits. So are there any tricks and tips to make our content? And uh, uh, the one thing is that uh, whenever uh, I proofread my content and it's well furnished through Hemingway and Grammarly, that won't pass at all. It means the chances of getting Detected as AI increases. <laughs> so that's becoming a major problem for me. Okay. So I'll tell you what typically originality is looking for at least. Because copy leaks, though, like almost everything is human text for copy leaks. Um, <laughs> originality is more stringent. What if your text is sounding mechanical? Okay. 
if which is where when i say when you if you're writing academically right if your words are heavier if your sentences are monotonous if you know um you're not writing conversationally then originality and if you're repeating a point over and over again if that's when it gets flagged as ai right because those are the kind of indicators these tools are looking for saying you know uh, is it machine generated or human generated if you make it more conversational, right? If you use simpler words, if you use, um, you know, one of the emails talked about how your writing should sing, right? Short, mm -hmm. medium, long sentences and vary the lengths and, you know, make it um, more palatable. That's when your you will see that the percentage of AI will go down. Uh, thank you. Cool. Narita, hi. Can you unmute? Uh, hello. Hi, Supriya. Narita here. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, insightful session. Well, my question is, uh, I am a technical person. I have more than 10 years of experience uh, in IT industry. And uh, because I've stayed for more than a decade in Japan, I know Japanese. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, can uh, this combination of uh, technical knowledge with the Japanese uh, can be used in India in content creation? Are there any projects uh, where you have some Japanese articles which can be uh, translated or stuff like that. Is Are there any opportunities? I haven't come across any, unfortunately, but I'm sure there must be. But why are you like limiting yourself to India? Why can't you get projects from Japan? Uh, in Japan, they'll not use English. They'll only use Japanese. Yeah, yeah but you do know Japanese, right? Yeah, but... In Japan, it's like they will. Uh, they need Japanese, which would be like native level. So they have Japanese people for that. Okay. So I'm wondering if we have uh, some options available here in India where they want Japanese content to be translated into, you know, English. It's some technical in technical space. I am sure there are companies who would need that done, but that could be at a very, uh, you know, department level as, as such. Maybe not under the purview of marketing. So okay. you might have to, I'm sure automotive would have a lot of uh, requirement like that, right? So you can reach out to people in those domains, which which typically work with Japanese clients or vendors and check with them if they have requirements. Translation definitely is a requirement, but I've not, never come across something specifically for Japanese. I know okay. the reverse, right? A lot of uh, companies here want to translate into uh, other languages english into other languages for their websites etc or their you know case studies for other geographies um but i haven't seen the reverse happening unfortunately okay got it thank you so much Sophia. um awesome thank you so much guys i think that's it i will share this recording on, on an email hopefully by monday uh if not tomorrow and I also put it in the WhatsApp group. So um, if you know you want to revisit any of that, you can do that in your at your leisure. Thank you so much for joining and staying on for so late uh, on a Friday evening. I will see you again sometime soon. And wishing you a very happy new year. Bye-bye. Yeah.